Hello everybody and welcome to our video introducing the topic of derivatives. So we're going to consider the problem of finding an instantaneous rate of change. For example, the instantaneous rate of change of a position function would be velocity. So oftentimes in the past we've dealt with average velocities. So for example, if I know that you started at point A on a highway, and over the course of one hour, you ended up at point B that was 75 miles away, then that would tell me that your average velocity for that one hour was 75 miles per hour. However, that doesn't tell me anything about what your velocity at any of the instants uh, in time were. I won't be able to read your speedometer and know how fast you were going at each moment. So, this problem is really saying, hey, if we know the position function of an object, any object, can we reverse engineer the velocity at any moment in time by just starting with that position function? Now, of course, the idea of instantaneous rate of change applies to many things other than just position and velocity, but this is a good... Uh, sort of obvious example for you to use to get grounded in what we're talking about with this concept. So before we can figure out how to evaluate instantaneous rate of change, we first got to figure out how to find the average rate of change. So let's take a look at this graph. We've got a function graphed here at two points, x and a are the x values, and then f of x and f of a. And if we look at the uh, red line here, well, what do we see? Well, first of all, f of x minus f of a over x minus a is the change in y, and x minus a is the change in the x value, right? You're just subtracting the difference, so that's just how much have they changed. And so by definition, that's the average rate of change from x to a. But also, it's the slope of the line between x and a, right? y1 minus y2 over x1 minus x2. It's the slope of the line between x and a and the average rate of change from x to a. Now, this average is taken over the time from x to a, but what if I wanted to take it over shorter times? So as we take x values close to a, our averages are taken over a shorter period of time. So what kind of averages do we get? Well, we'll get, say, f of x1 minus f of a divided by x1 minus a, and then we'll get f of x2 minus f of a over x2 minus a, and f of x3 minus f of a, over x3 minus a. So, our time period is getting shorter, and that should be getting us closer, conceptually speaking, to the instant rate of change, right? The instant velocity over that time. The shorter the time period, the closer we are to looking at the instant rate of change. So if we look here, what do we see? We've got three lines drawn between each x value and this point a. So our time x1, x2, x3 is getting closer to a. It's a shorter interval. And we've colored the slopes of these lines red here, green, and blue. So it's a little bit easier to see you know, rather than using the same color for all of them. And so what do we see? We see that the closer we get, there's something happening in the way the lines are drawn between the two points. Well, imagine that we just keep allowing the x values to get closer and closer. And what do these lines approach? They approach this line that's just touching the graph here, right? The more you move this point in, the more the slope of the line between the points approaches this. And so this line here that we think of as hugging the curve at A, 
We call this the tangent line of f of x at a. And the slope of this line is what you get from taking the limit as x approaches a of these other slope formulas, right? So you're taking your average slope, f of x minus f of a over x minus a, and you're just taking the limit as x approaches a. As the period of time shortens down to zero, take the limit of that average rate of change. That's what we define as the instantaneous rate of change at a and the slope of the tangent line of f of x at a. Now, we will write this formula in various forms. So one of the other forms that we often use it in, you'll see is here. If we substitute in place of uh, x minus a, if we write h, so h would be just the distance between any x value and a. So if we just write that distance, h equals x minus a, then my denominator becomes just h. My x can be replaced with h plus a, which is what we get here. I've just replaced x in my formula. And so now if x is approaching a, that's equivalent to saying that h is approaching zero. If x gets close to a, a minus a is zero, right? So this is just an equivalent form of this limit. And sometimes this form is easier to compute than the other form. That's why we use it. So now let's wrap this up in a definition. So now instead of writing this limit in terms of a, which was our fixed point, we're going to describe this limit in terms of any arbitrary x value. So all I've done is just rewrite this formula with x in place of a. So the derivative of a function f denoted by f prime is the function defined by f prime of x equals the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h, provided that this limit exists. And a second definition, if f prime of a exists, then the equation of the tangent line to the graph of the function y equals f of x at the point p, a f of a, is y equals f prime of a, x minus a, plus f of a. This is just point slope form. y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. Move the y1 across. but we're writing it in the function notation. So our slope here is the derivative. x1 was the value a, and y1 is f evaluated at a. So it's the same thing as your point slope form. It's not a new formula. We just have to keep in mind that in this context, the slope is the derivative at a. Okay, so we're going to tackle this example. Compute the derivative of f of x equal to 2x squared plus 3 at x equals negative 2. So there's actually two ways I could approach this. I could take my derivative formula generically in terms of x and then plug in negative 2 at the end, or I could plug in negative 2 first and compute it there. The first option has a big advantage, which is that it allows me to then reuse that formula for different values of x. The second way is often easier to compute, but I'm going to do the first way. So, especially at first when I'm practicing these derivatives, I'm going to write out my derivative definition every time that I go to use it. Now, as always, when we deal with this function notation, keep in mind that this x plus h has to substitute in place of your entire expression x. So, when I write f of x plus h, I need to write my function, put a parentheses in place of my x,
And in that parentheses that I put in place of x, I need to put my new expression, x plus h. Now here we just have minus f of x, so I can just rewrite the function normally. And this whole thing is being divided by h. Now, we should recall from working on limits that our goal here is to get rid of the discontinuity, right? We can't divide by zero. So when h is approaching zero, this h in the denominator causes me problems. So my goal is to cancel that h out, and then I'll be able to plug in. So I first am going to have to do some algebra and simplify what's up top here. x plus h squared becomes x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. Still got that plus 3 there. And then I'm going to distribute this negative. That's minus 2x squared minus 3. Now I'm going to multiply this 2 out. And I get 2x squared plus 4xh plus 2h squared plus the 3 minus the 2x squared minus 3. Now I can cancel 2x squared with negative 2x squared, 3 with negative 3. And we can rewrite this limit in a more simple form. Now remember, my goal is to cancel this discontinuity, the h here. So I'm going to factor out an h up top. Now I can cancel h over h. This becomes just the limit as h goes to 0 of 4x plus 2h. And if h is approaching 0 here, I no longer have a discontinuity, so I can just plug in. I get 4x plus 0, which is 4x. Now, the question specifically asks to find the derivative at x equals negative 2. So now that I have a nice formula for my derivative, I can just plug in negative 2 into that formula. 4 times negative 2 is negative 8. And although the question didn't ask anything about this specifically, just remember what this means is that the rate of change of this function at the x value negative 2 is negative 8. That's what this derivative is telling us. Okay, so let's go ahead and compute another one of these derivatives. Find the derivative of f of x equals the square root of x. Now, if the problem doesn't specify to find the derivative at a specific point, then that means you just leave the formula in terms of x. So our derivative, f prime of x, is the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. So what you should really notice here is that every problem we deal with in these derivatives, all of these limits are types of limits you've had to deal with before. So they shouldn't really be new. Uh, they're still sometimes tricky, for sure, but they should be at least familiar. You've seen problems like this in the past. So f of x plus h, take wherever x was and replace it with x plus h minus f of x, which is just the square root of x, all divided by h. Okay, so now to get rid of this type of limit, to get rid of the discontinuity, I need to get rid of my square roots here. And... I might recall that I can do that by multiplying by the conjugate. So I multiply by the square root of x plus h plus the square root of x on the top and bottom. Again, that's because now I'm just really multiplying by 1, since I did the same to the top and bottom. And I'm just going to rewrite my denominator. Remember, again, your goal is to cancel the h on the bottom 
So if I multiply the H out, that's just going to make that job harder. So you don't want to multiply your denominator out, but you do need to multiply the numerator out. And remember, the whole reason we're multiplying by conjugates is because when I take a minus b times a plus b, I just get a squared minus b squared. So here, the square root of x plus h squared is just x plus h minus the square root of x squared is just x. And x minus x cancels. I get left with h over h times this expression in the denominator. And h divided by h is 1. So now we're looking at the limit as h goes to 0 of 1 over the square root of x plus h plus the square root of x. My discontinuity has been canceled now. So now I can just plug in h equals 0. I get 1 over the square root of x plus the square root of x. That's 1 over 2 times the square root of x. All right, so that's it for that one. Now, example three, find the equation of the tangent line to f of x equals the square root of x at a equals two. So remember, y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. But when I rewrite this, this becomes y equals the derivative at a times x minus a plus f of a, right? I'm just taking my point slope form, writing it in the function notation. So what do I need to know? I need to know what f of a is and what f prime of a is. I already know what a is. So what's f of 2? That's just the square root of 2. Done. What about f prime of 2? Well, we already computed this derivative. The derivative for that function is 1 over 2 times the square root of x. So if I want the derivative at 2, that's going to be 1 over 2 root 2. And now I can just plug all that information into my linear equation here. y equals 1 over 2 root 2 times x minus 2 plus f of 2, which is the square root of 2. And generally, you're going to be expected to do some level of simplification here. So I will start by distributing this. I get x over 2 root 2 minus 2 over 2 root 2 plus root 2. This 2 over root 2 simplifies to 1 over root 2. Sorry, 2 over 2 times root 2 simplifies to 1 over root 2. So let's rewrite this so far. We've got y equals x over 2 root 2 minus 1 over root 2 plus root 2. Now, there's a whole bunch of ways we could rewrite this. Typically, uh, I would say you'd want to first combine these together. So first I'll find a common denominator. So this becomes negative 1 over root 2 plus 2 over root 2. Now, to be honest, for my personal purposes, uh, I want to be clear, this would be fine for me. But when you're dealing with any sort of computer system, generally you're going to be expected to simplify first. So this becomes x over 2 root 2 minus 1 plus 2 over root 2, that's plus 1 over root 2. And uh, let's go ahead and rewrite that whole thing again, y equals x over 2 root 2. Honestly, the simplification part of this problem is the worst part. So you're usually going to be expected to rationalize as well. So now that we've 
Combine those other terms, let's go ahead and rationalize, multiply by root two over root two. This gives us root two x over two times two, which is four, plus root two over two. So in my view, this is way more than we need to do for simplification, but just in case you're expected to do it in any sort of homework system, that's what you got to do. All right, so now that we're done with that one, let's go ahead and move on. So now let's think about what this stuff means in terms of graphs. So using the graph, determine the equation of the tangent line to the function at the point. Well, the graph we're given here, this is our function, and this is the tangent line. So all I need to do, well, I need to figure out what is the derivative. To find the equation of the tangent line, I need to know the derivative at the point. But the derivative at the point is, by definition, the slope of the tangent line. So that's just 2 minus 1 over 4 minus 2. y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. It's 1 over 2. And now I can pick either of my points. I'll pick the point 2. Well, I can't pick either of... That's... Let me rephrase that. Either of these points will allow me to find the equation of the line, but since I'm asked to do it in the form of the tangent line to the function at the point, we would generally expect to see it written in terms of the point on the function. Hopefully that's clear. So I'll use this point 2, 1. That's my a, f of a, of course. So now, uh, my equation for my tangent line, y equals f prime of a times x minus a plus f of a. So I get y equals 1 half times x minus 2 plus 1. Now we do a little simplification. Distribute the 1 half. I get x over 2 minus 1 plus 1. Negative 1 plus 1 is 0, so this is just y equals x over 2. That's a real nice, simple equation. Okay, and again, now we're going to just do one more problem that's just about uh, thinking about this idea conceptually, right, rather than computing them. So the graph represents the population of a bug species over time. Rank the points from least to greatest in regards to the rate of change of the population. So, P, well, let's, uh, let's instead of using P for the population, well, we'll just use F for the population. F of X is the population. So what I want to know is which of these rates of change is the smallest which is the largest and everything in between. So if I want the smallest rate of change, I'm looking at the rate of change at this point R. So we're looking at DF, well, we haven't introduced that notation. You'll get that in Calc 1. F prime of X. It's the rate of change of population. Okay, so rate of change of population. What's the smallest rate of change? Well, the points R and S, the rates of, not R and S, R, just R. That's R and Q. There we go. I can read a graph. <laughs> Let's try that again. The points R and Q have negative slopes. The negative slope at R is the steepest. So R is my smallest rate of change. The rate of change of the population is going down. And you can see that in the fact that the graph itself is going down. Population is going down, and so the slope of the tangent lines are negative. Q also has a negative slope on its tangent line. And we see it's not as steep as R, but the population is still decreasing, which makes sense with our graph, right?
Now we look at P and S, and S is by far the steepest, so that means S is next and P is last. All right, so that's it. Well, that's everything for our video on derivatives. Thank you for watching.